play a brand new song tonight called uh, Victory in Jesus. Anybody ever heard that? You're supposed to smile on that song. You ready? Love this song. Sing together, everybody. Tell the story. I heard an old, old song. Sing like never before. Oh, my. 
chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. We're getting there, folks. We're getting there, right? <laughs> it has been a great study. Acts chapter 20. We're starting in verse 13 tonight, and we're going to work our way down through verse 38. We all understand the concept that if you want to accomplish something, then you have to have the mindset and the drive to accomplish it, right? I hope you understand what I'm saying there. If you really think about it, if, if you want to accomplish something that is really important to you, simply put, you have to stick with it, right? You have to stick with it. And there is one word that really should be a driving factor to have that proper mindset, and it is the word consistency. Consistency. Not perfection, but consistency. I want you to think about that. Not perfection, but consistency. I mean, that's why professional athletes and, and musicians spend hour at their sport or their craft. You know, though they're not perfect at it, but they are consistent at it. And because they have that determination and mindset of the goal that they want to accomplish, friends, simply put, they're good at what they do. They are good at what they do. You know, as believers, friends, I hope all of us in here would simply say that we want to do good for the Lord. Right? Well, we want to do the best that we can. And as true believers, church, we should all have a mindset for ministry. But you know what? That takes consistency in your walk. It takes being consistent in your walk with the Lord. C.H. Spurgeon once said this. He said, a man's life is always more forcible than his speech. When men take stock of him, they reckon his deeds as dollars and his words as pennies. If his life and his doctrine disagree, the mass of onlookers accept his practice, listen to this, and reject his preaching. I agree with that. People notice what we do before what we say, okay? And that's something we need to remember. And in our passage of Scripture tonight, we're going to see the Apostle Paul. He is going to address the Ephesian elders to have the mindset of ministry. And he really lets them know what this really looks like. Now, yes, friends, obviously we know that uh, in, in the New Testament, the, the word pastors, elders, and overseers are, are synonymous with one another. But he is letting them know that they should pay careful attention to his words. But actually, he's letting all of us know that these words that we're going to see right here tonight are beneficial to each and every one of us. They are beneficial for all of us. Because I said this morning, I said a little while ago, and I'm going to keep saying it throughout this message, you have a ministry as well. Whether you realize it or not, every single one of you in this room has a ministry if you are a child of God. 
Okay? So that's what he is letting us know here in, in this passage. So every Christian church should care about the church and should seek to follow Paul's example just as Paul followed Christ. And here's the thing. I, I, I want to remind you, uh, friends, those that are not Christians but are exploring the Christian faith, you know what? They will find that by studying the church, they're going to learn a lot about Jesus. So my question is, what are you teaching about Jesus? If they're watching and learning, what are they really learning from watching you? What are they learning about Jesus? And so when we learn as Paul addresses the church tonight, that we should all strive to have the mindset for ministry. I honor and reverence the reading of the Word of God. If you're physically able, please stand with me. We're going to finish out chapter 20 tonight. Start with verse 13. Then we went ahead to the ship and said to Asus, they're intended to take Paul on board, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. And when he had met us at Asus, we took him on board and came to Mytilene. We sailed from there, and the next day came opposite Caius. The following day we arrived at Samos and stayed there at Trogigilum. Say that ten times fast. The next day we came to Miletus, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know, from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you, and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see now, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life here to myself, so that I so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch, and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone, night and day, with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more, and they accompanied him to the ship. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this time you've given us. Lord, I pray that we apply it to our lives. Lord, I pray that, Father, we, we truly realize it's not about us. It's all about you. And that our mindset for our own lives is to point people to you. Lord, you are the goal, as we talked about that this morning. So, Father, I pray that we relax, we stay calm as we talk this morning, but, Father, we carry forth with the plan that, that you want us to fulfill. And so, Lord, I pray right now that you, you, you give us wisdom to have the mindset of ministry, as the Apostle Paul has given these elders right here in Ephesus. And so, Lord, I pray right now that you use this time to speak to hearts, draw people to yourself. Lord, I pray that you encourage the saints. Father, and I pray that if there is someone here tonight that is lost and does not know you as Lord, Savior, Father, I ask that you draw them in as well. Father, save the soul tonight. Save souls. <laughs> Lord, whatever it may be, but Father, I pray that people are obedient to hear the calling that you've laid upon them. So Lord, use this time right now, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. 
In verses 13 through 16, we see Paul rushing to get to Jerusalem to make it for Pentecost. Now we know that seven weeks actually separated Passover from Pentecost. So Paul did not want to make a long delay in Ephesus. He did not want to stay there long, and that delay may have come from the troubles that we've already seen there in Ephesus in weeks previous. And, and so maybe he was thinking, if I go back there, who knows if I'll be detained there, and so I won't be able to get to Jerusalem. Or maybe if I'm there, if I, I start teaching again, I, I get held up by the church. For whatever reason, he decides not to go back through Ephesus. So the apostle, he, he bypasses Ephesus, and he lands a little further south in a town called Miletus. He goes a little further south right there, and we see this from verses 13 through 15. But despite his hurry, don't miss this church. Despite his hurry, he still takes time to invest in the people. He still takes time to invest in the people. So he calls the leaders of the Ephesian church to himself. He calls everyone together. And here in Miletus, Paul really gives them a powerful charge about having the right mindset for ministry and church, he begins by his own example. And that's the first thing that I want us to look at tonight. That, that's the first pattern I want us to see. I want you to see that Paul leaves for them and for us a pattern to follow. He leaves a pattern to follow. Notice right here in verse 18 through 21 again. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now skip down to verse 26. This one he says in verse 26 and 27. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Now skip down to verse 33 to 35, okay? We're looking at a lot tonight, I understand that. Listen to verse 33. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my own necessity. And for those who are with me, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We see right here, Paul gives the people a pattern to follow. Paul was saying, hey, pay attention to what I've done. Now, I want to let you know, friends, that there are four things that I want to teach you about Paul's pattern that he actually left for us to follow right here. Four different patterns. I'll put these in your notes. Number one, we see his unshakable commitment to God and his people. We see his unshakable commitment to God and to his people. We see that in verses 18 and 19. Now, church, listen to me. We know that commitment, that word commitment, means different things to different people. Right? We agree with that. It means different things to different people. It's like the story of the young man. Now, he found a girl that he was just found himself smitten with. Right? I mean, he, he, was, just, he was just head over heels with her. And he decided to sit down and, and, and write, a, write a letter to this girl. He's just going to pour his heart out to her. And this is the girl of his dreams. And this is what he wrote. He said, my dear, I would climb the highest mountain. I would swim the widest stream. I would cross the burning desert. I would die at the sake just to see you. P.S. I will see you on Saturday if it doesn't rain. <laughs> right? Just how committed... Bless it. But listen to me, church. Paul was not like that. Paul was not like that. He was totally committed to his fellow believers. He shared with them. He wept with them. Read verse 31 again. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day. Notice that. With tears. With tears. Church, Paul was passionate. He didn't have the flippant attitude of, well, I'm sure this will, whether you get it or not, that's up to you. No, he wept. He wanted people to get it. He wanted people to understand that, that he cared for them. He was there. There's no doubt in my mind that, that Paul was there in the midst of their hurts. There was no doubt that Paul was there in the midst of their joys. But Paul cared. He cared for the people. But can I tell you, friends, that's just his pattern. This is his pattern. Listen to what he wrote to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
2, verse 7 and 8. He said this, But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, listen to this, but also our own lives, because you had become so dear to us. There it is. I cared about that. That's what Paul's saying. Hey, hey, you know what he, he said? Just like a nursing mother cherishes her own child, that's how much I care for you. And he says, I, I, I'm so pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. <laughs> Listen, this is not someone that is just going through the motions. This is someone that truly cared. Paul identified with his people. And because he was committed to them and loved them, you know what that meant? He knew their needs. He knew what they were struggling with. Friends, th this is where I'm scared of where we're getting at in the society today. We are so isolated from one another. And, not, and let me just say this. I'm not talking about just COVID. I'm talking about the fact that people today don't even know who their own neighbors are. We pull, hey, one of the worst inventions ever with the two-car garage. What? You pull up, you hit the button, you go in your garage, you don't even see your neighbors, don't talk to your neighbors or anything else, and you go right in. Now you're just being crazy. But how often do you talk to your own neighbors? Some of you may say every day, well, good. But the fact of the matter is, we're not as social as we used to be. Yeah. We're not. And, and because of that, church, we don't know the needs. We don't know the needs. Oh, we may hear. And then we say, what? Well, I'm their next door neighbor, and I didn't even know that. Well, church, I, I, I want to remind you. I, I mentioned this last week. But I want to encourage you right now. Call one another. If the Lord has laid someone on your heart, call them. Call them. If you don't feel comfortable going and seeing them, call them. Reach out to them. Let them know you care. It's not just your staff's job. It's not. We are all called to minister. But as verse 19 says, Paul served the Lord with humility and tears. And notice this. He served them with trials. Don't miss that word that's used right there. He served them with trials. So church, his humility, friends, it denotes his posture before God and people. But think about that statement. Serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears, and trials. Church, I, I would say that this kind of service to the Lord is a direct result of the proper grasp of the gospel. This is something that really gets... You see, friends, when, when the gospel is applied, what does it do? It humbles us. When we realize it, it humbles us. And then you know what it does? It makes us tender. And then not only does it make us tender, friends, listen to me, it makes us courageous. It makes us courageous. And when it makes us courageous that we're going to stand for Christ, we're going to stand for the gospel no matter the cost, guess what? Yes, we will still be, we'll still be humble, but you know what? We'll stand for truth. And when you stand for truth, that will cause trials. It will cause trials. But friends, not only did he know the needs, but he also knew how to apply God's word to those needs. Which then, friends, that leads us to our second pattern, that we see his commitment to the word. Go back and, and look at verse 20 and 21 again. L listen to what he says right here, verse 20 and 21. How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you. And taught you publicly, and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what Paul said right here? He didn't hold anything back. He wasn't scared. Listen, he wasn't worried about being politically correct. He wasn't worried about that. He taught the gospel to everyone that would listen. Everyone that would listen. Here is another wonderful example for us to follow. Church, don't shrink back from teaching the world about Jesus. Don't shrink back from that. Don't cave into the culture. As a matter of fact, I love down in verse 27. Look at verse 27 again. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I've not shunned. In other words, I haven't held back. I, I 
I've been faithful to do what God has called me to do. Which then, friends, that leads into the third pattern that he had a commitment that produced a clear conscience. He had a commitment that produced a clear conscience. Hey, look at it again right here. Look at verse 26 and 27. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. You know, when you really go back and you look at the life of Paul, Paul's accused of a lot of things. He'd been called a lot of different names. <laughs> He'd been blamed for a lot of different things. But you know what? Paul could honestly sit back and say, nobody's blood is on these hands. What? Yeah, you, you heard him, right? Let me ask you this question. Can you honestly say that tonight? I'll be honest with you, and I'll tell you that I cannot. What do you mean, Brother Callum? There have been times when I know that I should have shared, and instead I withheld. Am I the only one? I know that the Holy Spirit said, hey, share with this individual. And for some reason, in my own sinful mind, I said, I've got something else to do. For some reason, maybe I said, well, you know what, I don't have enough time right now. Maybe the business, or, or you know what, I will later. How about that one? I will later. Paul was saying, you know what? He, he didn't hold back. <laughs> Church, I know once again there were times that I, I withheld, I should have told. But you know what? May I learn from it. May I learn from it and be bold to share from here on out. But then we see a fourth commitment in his pattern that he leaves for us. He had a commitment to being content. Oh, this will speak to all of us tonight. He had a commitment to being content. Content. This is verse 33 through 35. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Church, Paul made sure that him and his team, that they were taken care of. And ultimately, Paul is saying right here, he's like, listen, I did not want to be a burden to anyone else. I want to make sure that we're taken care of. He want to take care of others' needs. Church, listen to me. He did not have the me first mentality. He didn't have that. No, 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 no. You see, in Paul's last recorded words to the Ephesian elders is a quotation from the Lord Jesus himself. And it's beautiful. He quotes the Lord. He says, he says right here, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Beautiful. And I want to remind you, friends, that that statement right there summarizes everything that Paul said to his brethren. It really did. Everything that he's saying right here. <laughs> Church, what a pattern to follow. But not only, friends, did Paul leave us a pattern to follow, but he also assures us to watch out for the problems of the future. He assures us to watch out for the problems in the future. Listen to verse 22 and 23. Go back. This is what he says right here. And see now, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Now skip down to verse 29. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. See, Paul knew that going to Jerusalem was going to involve some suffering. He knew that it was a heartache. But because he valued Jesus above comfort, and listen to me, friends, he valued Jesus even above his own life. Because that was the case, he was willing to go. Matter of fact, he was anxious about going. Can you imagine that? Knowing if I go over here, this is probably going to cost me my, my life. But I can't wait. So he, that's what he was getting at right there. He was willing to go. It didn't matter to him. You see, friends, his desire was to finish the ministry that Jesus gave him. And you know, church, that's the key. That, that is the key. The goal of life is not to live a long life, but a full life. A life that is lived to the glory of Jesus Christ, no matter how difficult that life may be. That is the goal. You see, church, we all need to understand that faithfulness will eventually involve hardship. 
Faithfulness will eventually lead into persecution. Faithfulness will possibly even lead to martyrdom. But we must value Jesus above everything and rely upon the Holy Spirit. Do you see what he said there earlier? It was the Holy Spirit that was leading him to go to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit. You see, friends, that's where we have to pay attention. We have to listen to the Spirit of God. But here's the sad thing. When you look down in verse 29 and 30, y'all don't miss this. Please don't miss this. When you look down in verse 29 and 30, you realize the problems will not only come from the outside, but sadly, friends, many of the wolves will come from the inside. That's the sad thing. Notice what he says right there. Those wolves will come in among. Will come in among. He's talking about they will come in among the believers as well. Church, that's the sad thing. That some of our own problems, if we're not careful in the future, will come from those within. Come from those within. And church, I'll go ahead and tell you, and you know this as well as I do, that there are churches today that are battling false doctrine from even within. And let me just say this. Let's talk a little bit about this church here in Ephesus. Ephesus right here was at this time a healthy church. But I do want to remind you that at the time that Paul writes to Timothy, who was leading the church in Ephesus in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, and also chapter 3, verse 1 through 9, we see that the wolves had already come in. Go back and study it later. The wolves had already entered in and was teaching a deviant doctrine. They were teaching a false doctrine. And then, listen to me, church, some 35 years later, Jesus Christ himself even told the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Church, why had they gotten this way? Simply put, this was, this was about 40 years later after Paul wrote what he did right here, and, or, or after what he said to the Ephesian elders right here. So around 40 years later, 35 years, once again, after, after he wrote Timothy, Jesus said this. So, so why? How did they get that way in just a matter of, of around 40 years? How did they get that way? Because of the problems within. The problems within. Church, I, I love you. And I'm asking for all of your help. We must all be on guard against false doctrine. We must all be on our guard because church, the devil loves for us to have problems. Especially if he can bring in false doctrine and heresy into the church. That's what he tries to do. Church, more churches have been divided over false doctrine than anything else. Church, may we be known, may Central Baptist Church be known as a church that sticks to the truth of the Word of God. Amen. May we be known as that. Even when the world says it's not politically correct, it's God knows correct. And may we stick to that, no matter what it may cost us. Hey, I'm going to tell you this today. I, I got a message from a church member that said a sister church of ours here in town was talking a little bit about the election stuff, and their feed was cut today here in town. Um, it's coming, friends. It's coming. May we stand for the word of God, and may we always stand for truth. But finally, friends, to have a mindset for ministry, not only did Paul leave us a pattern to follow and teach us to be watchful for problems in the future, but he also leaves us with a plan for fulfillment. He leaves us with a plan for fulfillment. Listen to verse 24 and 25, and then skip down a little bit to 31 and 32. It says this, But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Now skip down to verse 31 and 32. Therefore watch, 
And remember that for three years I have not ceased to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Church, we see that Paul had a plan for himself and a plan for the church. Think about it. Paul was going to face his future difficulties. He was going to face them head on, understanding that church, it wasn't about him anymore. He realized that it's not about him anymore. And with that mentality, notice what he said. Underline it. This is so good. He said that he was going to finish my race with joy. That'll preach in itself. No matter what comes my way, no matter what difficulties I face, hey, I know that I have finished my race. <laughs> and he says, I want to do it with joy. And we know that he did. How can you say that, Brother Kyle? Because of what he told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 7, his last letter. He said, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I have kept the faith. Huh. That's not someone that's in sorrow. To me, when I read that, I, I said it with passion. Because I believe that Paul probably broke the lid when he was writing. He was so excited. Hey, I've done it. I've done it. You see, in the plan for the church, the plan for the church is that we all as well must watch and warn as Paul did. Read 31 again. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn Everyone, night and day, with tears. Church, as believers, we are all called to watch and warn. Underline those two words. You don't mind writing your Bibles. Watch and warn. Watch and warn. Church, may we watch and warn, understanding that one day, friends, we will have, as verse 32 says, an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. That's what we talked about this morning. Hey, heaven bound, baby. And we will have an inheritance among all those that have been sanctified. Man. You see, friends, Paul fulfilled his plan. He did. And what's amazing is verse 36 through 38 says that he sailed off to keep fulfilling that plan. <laughs> he sailed off to do what God called him to do, thus providing us with a great example of someone who had a mindset for ministry. Church, I don't know about you, but I'm encouraged tonight. This passage encourages me. It really does. I, I'm encouraged to do more for the kingdom. May you have a mindset to do more for the kingdom. May you have a mindset realizing what Christ has done for you. And so, you know what? <laughs> you realize what Paul's dealing with right here, and, and you want to have the same mindset. Church, man, we have the mindset realizing that, that this man left us a great pattern to follow. Oh, yes, there will be problems in the future, but I have a plan that I need to fulfill, and that's letting others know about Jesus. That's the plan. Palin's plan is no longer about Palin. It's about Jesus. And you know what? I, I have to remind myself of that quite often. Because Colin's plan sneaks right back in the way far too often. Anybody else? It sneaks back in the way. And i got to remind myself far too often, it's not about you, bro. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So as we close off tonight, maybe, maybe you're here tonight and you say, you know, I, I'm a believer, but I haven't had the mindset of ministry. If that's you, then friends, maybe you just want to come to this altar tonight and spend some time with the Lord. But I'll say this as well, friends, you will never have a mindset for ministry until you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So if you're here tonight and you don't have that relationship and you know you don't have a relationship with Jesus, then friends, I pray that you come. I'll be right here. I'd love to introduce you to the King of Kings tonight. On a Sunday night Bible study, I'd love to introduce you to our Lord. I promise you, you'll never regret me. If you need to come, I pray that you come. But Church, maybe you just need to come tonight and pray for boldness to have a mindset for ministry. Lord, as we come to you right now, I pray, Lord, that we fully serve you more. God, may we have a mindset, Lord, of realizing what you've done for us, so we, we need to do more for you, God. God, I do want to thank you that it's not based upon works 
salvation, Father. It is a gift that you have given. But, Father, God, realizing this incredible gift that has been given, God, it should, it should impact us to want to do more for you. And so, Lord, I pray right now for this body of believers. I pray for this group of saints tonight. Lord, I pray that you just empower them with a mindset of ministry. The moment they walk out these doors, Lord, every day this week, and then weeks after, may we have a mindset for ministry. Father, I pray right now, for the, if there's someone here tonight that is lost, Father, I pray that you draw them in, Lord, let them see their need for you more than anything else, and Father, let them serve. Lord, I pray that you use this invitation time, it's yours, so speak in the heart those that need to hear. Draw people to yourself right now, Lord, I pray.